being recorded. Okay. So okay. we're being recorded now. Yeah. We're opening the October 14th Board of Health meeting. And pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so. They can find the link on the Amherst Board of Health website, and it is included in today's agenda, which is called the most recent agenda. Um, no in-person attendance will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship and despite best efforts, we will post on the Amherst Board of Health website an audio recording as soon as possible after this meeting. Okay, so today's meeting is open and the first item on the agenda is the two minutes, the first minutes from our September 9th meeting. And I read them, I didn't see any errors or typos that I saw, anybody else? I looked at them too. I read them. They seemed fine. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I need a motion to accept the minutes. I'll make a motion to accept the minutes of both the September 9th and oh, September 20th. I was going to do them one at a time. All right. For, we'll start with September 9th meeting. September 9th. Okay. So it's been moved. I need a second. I can second it. Thank you. Uh, any uh, further discussion? Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to accept September 9th meeting, um, meeting minutes for the Board of Health. All in favor? Maureen? Yes. Tim? Aye. Steve? Aye. Nancy? Yes. Okay. Uh, Nancy, and did we miss a roll call? <gasps> Yes, sorry. Roll call. Okay. Back up. Roll call in attendance. Tim? Here. Maureen? Here. Steve? Here. Nancy? Here. Lauren is not here and she has not signed the papers uh, um, for uh, being uh, accepted as a Board of Health member. Um, I did send her some emails last week, but never heard from her. Um, I'll follow up tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Now back, sorry for that little hiccup. September 27th draft uh, uh, minutes for our special virtual meeting on the COVID vaccine. Uh, they look fine to me. Does someone want to make a, a motion to accept them? Does anyone have any changes? Or I'll move to accept them. My minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you make I a motion to interest. accept them. We need a motion. To, uh, we need a second. I can I'll second that. Okay. All in. Any discussion? All in favor? Steve. Aye. Maureen? Yes. Tim? Aye. And, and Nancy? Aye. Okay. So next on our agenda is welcoming um, Lauren, but she's not here. So, and then... Um, Wait, you know what? I see her. And oh, see her. see... Lauren is um, in um, the attendees. I'm going to move her promoter to a panelist. Lauren, uh -huh. if you can hear me, uh, there's something on your end to acknowledge that you want to enter as a panelist. Yay. Hey. Yeah. Yes, hi. Sorry, it took me a minute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did you, did you hear what we were saying, Lauren? No, I just know you did the, the minutes 
Oh, okay. just went over the last meeting. You did it. not go to town hall to sign the, the papers oh. that got your letter. So you're not a, a approved to be on the board. You can be a guest today until you sign them. This has okay, happened okay. many times in the past. So um, okay. until we're, we're, <laughs> we're welcoming you. There was a you. lot of emails. <laughs> <laughs> we're welcoming you. There was a lot of emails, sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. There was, I, I, um, yeah. there was okay. way more homework this time than more than any yeah. other time. Yeah. So don't get too nervous about no. that. Okay. <laughs> So reach out to us and I sent you some information that might help you if you look over it about boards of health in Massachusetts. There were three emails. Yes, um, yes. Um, to, to help you okay. understand the board and, and some of its work and then we can all help you whatever way you need. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to keep briefly under um, old business is the, I have these, ah, I keep losing things here, um, the review and update on regulations. So I went through, we have 13 regulations, many of them are outdated, and the three that are most relevant right now to our work is the recombinant DNA, which Maureen did a whole lot of work looking on. Um, the refuse, which is coming up today because of the zero waste. And at our last meeting, I brought up the toxic chemical, which is from 2001 because of House Bill uh, 926, improving pesticide protection for Massachusetts school children. So we, we should review that. We have reviewed it in the past when the issue of Roundup came up and we got from the DPW at that point, Roundup was used, I believe it was in Groff Park on poison ivy after it was handpicked and they couldn't um, eradicate it so it was used a little bit. Um, but those are the three I think we should look at and um, update in the next six months to um, a year. And uh, Maureen, you've taken the lead on recombinant DNA. Well, I really just Googled around basically, <laughs> but I did notice that a lot of towns in Massachusetts have, have um, regulations in the same, of the same era, 2008-ish actually. Um, several towns don't have regulations at all, including Northampton and South Hadley, which also have, you know, two of the five colleges. So I was curious about that. Um, some of the towns in the Eastern part of the state have more um, recent uh, updates of their regulations. And some have added as, as these regulations basically ban the higher uh, risk labs in, in many towns, the level four. They regulate, um, they um, have permits for the, some of the lower risk labs and they have registration for some of the labs that fall at the bottom of the risk level or some that are even not part of this NIH uh, guideline that's that everybody refers to. So that's sort of what they're doing. But some of the towns have also, not just with the Board of Health, but have added a biosafety committee to their town, and which generally includes uh, one or two members from the Board of Health, plus some people who have some expertise in biosafety and in um, hazard generally how to deal with or hazards. Um, Watertown has the most recent update from 2020. And I think that kind of came about because they're getting this big gene therapy um, uh, research and manufacturing facility that's a Harvard MIT um, joint venture that's opening next year. So um, I think there's a lot of, I think where I saw this was a lot of the biotech towns in the eastern part of the state that have some more 
um, vigorous uh, activity in their town. I don't know what we need. I guess that was the question the thing I came down to is like, is what's changed? Uh, I did not read all 174 pages of some of the NIH guidelines, et cetera. I kind of looked at them to see if I could digest them. And I, you know, I kind of got the gist, but I didn't really have a good feel for, you know, what the levels actually mean, you know, in terms of if, if I'm looking at this organism and this genetic manipulation, what is that risky? I don't know. Anyway, um, so I thought we might need some expert help <laughs> um, to sort, sort that out. I can send an email to Cheryl Sabola and ask her Sabara. I have Cheryl Sabola is at UMass, and Cheryl Sabara is the uh, uh, public health. So I can um, send her an email and ask her. Um, the other thing, as we're talking, what's happening up at UMass? They have lots of labs up there. Do they're we? not under our our? But they're not under our. But no. the Amherst College one is. Right, and, and, and Hampshire, mm -hmm. if they, I don't know if there's anything that meets the need for that kind of um, regulation. Um, and, and like I said, you know, you, neither South Hadley or Northampton I, I, that I could find have um, a similar regulations. Mm -hmm. So I, I would assume the level of research would be similar amongst the five colleges, but maybe I'm not right about that. Um, anyway, it just, it really did seem like the, the one, it was banning the highest level risk labs and then knowing what's going on and maybe in case something happens. And three was making sure that the colleges are following or the labs are following the NIH guidelines around recombinant DNA and the CDC guidelines about uh, bio, uh, my, sort of microbiological research. And the only Massachusetts was referred to Massachusetts law was the law that allows towns and cities to hire experts if needed. It, they're not, it's not a, there's not a Massachusetts law that I could find that has any kind of regulation or guidance on this. So I think we need to ask some questions. <laughs> Steve, do you have a sense of this? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty much, you know, he was the former chair of the Amherst Bio Safety Committee that dealt with all that. Figured you might. <laughs> yeah, and uh, what I would say is that, you know, a lot of the, in the 1970s, even the lowest levels of genetic manipulations generated legitimate concern that there might be, you know, make, create a worldwide pandemic or something from these manipulations. But those concerns are really allayed by 40 years or 50 years, frankly, of, um, of work in that area. But it's definitely, so I would say, you know, if we wanted to consider something new, and I would not want to be in charge of it because I'm not an expert, but it's really a lot of the stuff that goes on, even at Amherst College, there's much more worry, I would say, about pathogens because they're, you know, like what mm -hmm. Alex Purdy is working on, she's very, very safe and everything, but that is way more dangerous than any genetic manipulations that are going on there. Those are, you know, cholera toxins and everything else are in the labs. And so if we wanted to be concerned about what could happen in the worst possible case, we maybe should have more of a general biosafety regulation that covers not just recombinant DNA, which is old hat now, and except for like level four, like you say, Maureen, Fort Detrick, Maryland is the only place mm -hmm. in the country, I think, that does level four. So of course, we shouldn't have level four, even level three, but the other levels are not a, much of a problem. So we can, you know, kind of review that and make sure, like you say, people are following the NIH guidelines. But I would say, you know, considering that pathogens are now very much used in some of that research, the Board of Health has legitimate reason to, to make sure that the colleges are following good procedures. For yeah, I think that the regulation as written does uh, include microbiological agents and toxins. Oh, so yeah, it's, well, it's yeah. broader than just recombinant DNA. And that falls under those 
I forget the, the letters, but the, the biosafety uh, guidelines of the CDC, exactly. um, yes. which is another whole set of guidelines. So, right. um, but, um, but it, yeah, you know, and I think what UMass had anthrax research going on um, in the past. Um, I don't think they do anymore, but, um, but it, it also, it, it says that they're not under the town's jurisdiction, and I don't know exactly why. So I think we need some guidance about where to start and maybe somebody to point us in the direction of someone who could help us assess what's needed. I'll send an email to Cheryl and, and CC everybody. Steve, would you like to work with Maureen on coming up with where we should be going with this this regulation um, given it's 2021 and the world is much different than it was when these originally came out and you know our process it doesn't happen that overnight we take our our time making sure everything's done correctly does that sound like a good plan sure i'll be happy to do that yeah yeah that would be great because okay and i'll get that email out tomorrow um, the refuse one is going to come up today with the zero waste. The other one is toxic chemical, which, as I said, was 2001. Um, and given the House bill, we should look at that and review it. Um, I know, Tim, do you feel like looking at, at, at that with maybe Lauren looking at, because that goes into the schools, Lauren, um, it's improving pesticide protection for Massachusetts school children. That's the house bill, but we wanna look at, at our own toxic chemical regulation given um, that bill that's in front of the house too. Do you, can you take that on Tim? Sure. Okay, with Lauren, after you sign your papers, how does that sound, Lauren, looking at that, given you're the, the mother of school children? Are you there, Lauren? She's muted, so maybe she. Uh, um, the sound is going in and out. So oh, okay. Oh. Um, Nancy, we have somebody with their hand up in a question, and I think it's John oh, Okay. Root. Darcy. I think it's it may be John Root. Um, can I allow him to yes. ask a question? All okay, right. yes. Is it John or is it Darcy? Um, Darcy? I, yeah, I had um an email that that may be John Root on that. Jar Dar Darcy or John, can you unmute and ask a question? Uh, I believe can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is John Root. I'm I'm on Darcy. Uh, Darcy's. I'm on Darcy's computer. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So I, I was just ready to do my presentation. If you're ready. Oh, okay. For yeah. No, I'm just saying. Oh, okay. The the topic is we're reviewing all of our 13 regulations to make a plan to go forward. So you're going to come up under new business. And I, uh, so the three regulations we're going to be working on in the next year are uh, the, the recombinant DNA, biosafety, toxic chemicals, and then refuse, thanks to your presentation. But we'll get to that in a few minutes, okay? Okay. All right. Yeah, John, I low in, lowered your hand. I, I have new Zoom right. skills. So Got it. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you until okay. it's time. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. So, how does that sound for a plan for our regulations? Um, I, I I looked them all up, and I have all the dates, and I was going to type it all up and send it to you, but then I thought, well, we already have three according to what's going on, and um, how does that sound as a plan for for board members? Sounds fine. Okay, great. Um, so Nancy, I'm going to say, and you can tell me what what the protocol is. There is someone with their hand up. If it's a question regarding these two things, should do we continue sure. to ask a question? Is that appropriate? Okay. Uh, yes, it's Samuel Gladstone. Uh, yeah, if he has a question related to the three regulations we're looking okay. at. Okay. So I'm Sam. I'm going to allow you to talk. Thank you. I just want 
So uh, I'm Dr. Samuel Gladstone. I actually was on the Board of Health in, in the 1990s. Uh, I know Maureen. And I just, my question is, is a, about the next issue or when people like John Root, is there a way to allow people who talk to be seen like the seven of oh, you? Yeah. So when we get to that, I, I can allow people um, privileges to do that. So when we get to that subject, um, I, can, I can let you enter on, and enable your video. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So that takes care of all of the other old, old gay in Jersey in the backyard. I'm glad you really care about one thing got put under new business, which is really old business, and that is our uh, racist statement that Steve sent out. We voted on at our last meeting, and we accepted the latest version with Tim's um, edits, and we just have to make a plan for signing it. And I said, I can go up to town. I, I can go up to the uh, health department next week and sign it. But Jen had an idea for getting it out. To oh, people. yeah. Um, right. I can I can um, expedite that. We have someone that can actually come to your home if that's um, helpful and with the document and you can sign yeah. it. I, I can come to town hall next week. I think I have a plan to do that already. <laughs> um, so I'd be happy to just not town hall, but the bank center, the health department. Yeah. Where is it actually? Is that the health department? Yes, in the bank okay. center. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Lauren, did you want to say something? Say something, Lauren. Do you have a question? Yeah, just unmute and speak on it. Yes. Okay. Oh, thank you. What well, was that sent to me as well or sent to everyone? The that document to be signed. I think when you when you're sworn in and ready to go, is that the but it it was done at our last meeting, which you were not a part of. So it'll just be the four of us because it, it was done in the in the September meeting. But did you get a copy of the um, statement to see? If it if was recently sent, I will look again. Okay. Um, I was a little okay. behind in okay. my emails. So. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit overwhelming. But yeah, we had voted it in our last meeting but we haven't signed it yet. Um, and everybody saw Tim's last edits um, that were already accepted, correct? Mm -hmm. Did you wanna say something, Steve? Uh, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I can come to, to the banks, no problem if it's easier. I'm not a problem for me to come at all. If, it's, if the door is open in the front, is the front door open these days? Um, the side door is open 10, oh, at, at 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Good, okay, that's good, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll get that but, signed before. But does, it, does everybody, how, do we know how it's going to get signed then? So I'm going to come in sometime and even during lunchtime, any, any restrictions on when that can be done? Um, there's no restrictions. If you want to contact me directly, um, I can, you know, be prepared uh, with a special pen to sign. Um, but it's 10 to 2. And I'll tell you why we'll get to it. But we have the new um, community COVID PCR testing. So our doors are open during that time. So. Good. OK, good. Right. Thank you. OK, now, new business. Ed Smith, I saw you there, Ed. We have the well application. Yes, hello. Hi, Ed. Hey. So I think this is the latest in a series of new wells out on Leverett Road. Um, these are parcels out of the old Kettridge estate. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. So I believe you would have gotten the materials that yeah. were shared from the applicant. Everything seemed in order to me, except one thing on my letter. There's an illustration on the back of the um, letter of support that I wrote, it indicates that there's an orange cone in the picture at the northwest corner. It's really the northeast corner. It's okay. um, and the northwest corner is the corner, or the southwest corner, excuse me, is the corner that the septic system will be off. So there's a great deal of separation. Um, and I really didn't see any issues with the site. 
I had a question, but I, I don't know the geology there. If they're going to be putting a future paddock and barn in, the well is uphill from it that the manure and all won't get into the... That's right. Well, um, yeah, there's a, a slight drainage down across the driveway presently. I imagine that they'll grade that out a little bit more than already was, but there shouldn't be any interference between the two. Okay. That was at what stage are we at? This is just a drilling permit, or like we're going to still see the toxicology from the you know the water sample uh, data later. That's right. This is just the drilling permit. There'll be um, a submission of a um, water supply application to you um, okay. to certify that it's an approved drinking water source. Good. Okay. So there, there have been problems only in aesthetic quality, I believe, to the water wells in that area. So they, they probably will have to deal with, um, is it magnesium, I think? Um, but at any rate, it's not a, a toxic. Mangani, I think it was maybe manganese or iron or something. Man manganese, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to pretend I'm John Tobias, but I'm not getting. Oh, thank you. Doing very good job. <laughs> yeah, so am I. Okay, I see that. I see that there's this paddock going in, but I'm hoping it's downhill yeah. from the well. Oh, good point. No, it's well separated. And there are no aquifers up there. Um, are there? Not feet. No, no, no town wells. Okay. Um, that are an issue there. There's a wetland that was marked out. It's well away from the area. Mm -hmm. um, it really was just open fields at one point um, and maintained that way for years by the Kittredge family. Now, uh, if they do put this horse barn in and a paddock, is there gonna be problem with manure and water there? No, I wouldn't anticipate so. Okay. Because it, it just says future, but I, I would be concerned about manure and water. Yeah, they have in a fair bit of land downhill and away from the site. So oh. I think that any pasturing of horses will be, you know, downhill for sure. Okay. Anybody else have questions? So oh, do we just need to give you approval or wh what do we have to do? Yeah, we, have to, we have to have a motion for a drilling permit, I think. Okay. Right. Also, okay. I'll, move, I'll move that we uh, accept the drilling permit or approve the dr drilling permit for 200 Leverett Road. Need a second? I can second that. Any further discussion? Okay. So all in favor of the drilling for the well application. Steve? Aye. Tim? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Okay. Hey, wait, me. Maureen, Maureen. Oh, Maureen, Maureen, Maureen. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Maureen. I'm seeing all these faces here. <laughs> sorry, Maureen. That's okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. I will. I can take the paperwork from here and we'll be back when the, the well is ready with the, the water supply request. Okay, right. great. Great. And I'm going to say goodbye for tonight. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, anything further on the tobacco violation order? Yeah, so let me update you with that. Um, Spirit House um, is next on the new business. Um, they had a compliance check through the Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition, the PVTC, on Thursday, September 23rd. And they, um, there was a sales to a, a minor. So this is the second sale to a minor um, within a 36 month period. So um, three things, this is at least how I've organized it in my brain, three things with them. And then if there's anyone from Spirit House, if you can raise your hand and we can hear from you in a minute, um, there's a fine, a $2,000 fine that they'll need to pay. They paid a $1,000 um, on September 20, um, wait, on their June 29th. 
This is a $2,000 fine. The second thing is a suspension for seven days. Um, and they have started that suspension of sales of tobacco. Um, thank you very much, Susan Malone. She went in person to um, serve them the cease and desist um, letter on October 4th. The suspension for tobacco is Tuesday, October 5th through the 11th. They're cleared to sell it on the 12th. And then the third part of this, you know, in how I'm organizing it, is there needs to be some kind of retail training for the staff. And so I think that's something that we've all talked about. And if it's okay with everybody, um, I'll, I'll take that on unless um, someone wants to do it. And if anyone wants to join me, but um, I have the tobacco products handler quiz and um, I'll take a look at it. Looks really comprehensive, but you know, just I have a fresh set of eyes. I can sort of take a look at that. And then with your support and your help, um, I'll figure out how to start working with um, the sellers. Right now I, I look, there are 19 people with tobacco license. So that's um, a, a big number. So let me sort of take over if, if that's a good plan and I can continue on with that because I think there needs to be some, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, training. Um, and then just as an FYI, just because I'm new to this, um, I put a call into Stephen McCarthy, um, just he's, you know, with licensing and I just want to report this to him. So he has an email, but I just haven't spoken to him. Is there anyone from Spirit House? I don't see any hands up. So that's what I have to report. And that's taking a lot on if you consider the fact that there's likely to be multiple sellers at each of the 19 places. Are you aware of that? Well, you know, I, I, I can tell you, I, I know the number, but maybe maybe I'll need some guidance with that or, or you know, how I can do it with inspections, you know, work it in, so. Um, but it seems like there need, we just need to sort of reboot that a little bit. Jen, I'm willing to help you in any way I can. Oh, okay, I right. developed that quiz with the hope yeah. that we would not be where we are today with this, this second violation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the regulations went into effect last January 1st. Um, there's been a lot of change and transition in the department and you're dealing with COVID and everything. So um, it, it, it slipped a little behind, but anyway, I can help you. Um, okay. And, and you had talked about getting materials together to, to bring, and I can help you bring them to the establishments to help them with a the process to do this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. So let me just take a real you know, a real deep look at this and see if it can be incorporated into other things that are going on or how okay. it needs to be done. But I, I appreciate right. that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I remember poking around about education for this and found that the DPH had a new video, I think, about uh, for for employees. It oh, might be worth just taking a oh, look. Yeah. Um, yeah. If that's helpful. Oh, absolutely. Right. I think it was a video. I think it wasn't just slides. Um, I know they have some new, a new pr program, you know, get outraged. So maybe they, yeah. they have some new yeah. material. And, and other states have uh, educational videos that they use um, to help prevent this too. Okay. Okay. So now. We will go on to Waste Hauler Zero Waste Committee. And um, I want to thank Darcy and John before you start. They've done a tremendous amount of work on this, and they're going to do a 15 minute presentation, and then it will open it up to questions and answers um, and how we go forward. And this is then also looking at one of our regulations. So Darcy and John. Okay, so you can hear, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, let's, 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 make you let, visible, let's see how okay? to, yeah. Oh, I'm now going to share the, uh, the, uh, okay. the slideshow okay. that we have. Whoops. Share screen right there. Can we make, can we make John visible? 
But I don't think it's necessary. He comes and goes. Let's see. There you are. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Hello. <laughs> um, okay. So we're sharing screen. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to uh, uh, introduce this uh, am amendment to the Board of Health regulations to include, include uh, curbside compostable materials pickup in basic hauler service. Uh, and uh, uh, my name, uh, by the way, is John Root. I used to be the chair of the Town of uh, Amherst Recycling Refuse Management Committee. Um, zero Waste Amherst is a volunteer organization that formed recently uh, they're committed to achieving zero waste, uh, and uh, one of their first priorities was to, to examine whether uh, we could change our hauler system to uh, reduce trash in our waste stream. And uh, so the proposal that uh, zero, zero Waste Amherst is offering is to review the uh, Board of Health regulations and add a hauling program that will move the town towards achieve, achieving these zero waste and climate action goals, develop a list of questions and suggestions within a month, work with CWA to finalize the amended regulations and vote to adopt those regulations within 90 days. Uh, the background is that um, I mentioned we, I was chair of the Refuse and Recycling uh, Committee. We submitted a solid waste master plan for adoption. It was a, a, a accepted with for consideration with enthusiasm, but nothing was done about it in part because of the timing, the transition to from the, the town meeting um, uh, to the, our present uh, government. So. Uh, and it was it, the the committee was dissolved because we were going to be part of the environmental uh, ECAC environmental climate action committee. So uh, this year uh, there was a DEP technical assistance grant uh, survey uh, that uh, demonstrated the best hauling practices of nine cutting edge communities, uh, and also Smith there was a Smith College capstone project survey that focused on Amherst and made recommendations for hauling practices. Uh, and uh, which are substantially what we're off offering now. Also, the uh, Environmental Climate Action Committee uh, recommended is, uh, recommend zero waste infrastructure changes uh, as part of what, what they're doing, one of their priorities. So uh, the Board of Health uh, has uh, the opportunity and the responsibility uh, to uh, address this uh, waste reduction as a public health issue. Um, uh, there, there is no away, of course, when we throw things away, uh, it's either going to go to a landfill or to uh, an incinerator and uh, landfills, uh, and, and they both are uh, uh, cause serious uh, public health uh, outcomes. Uh, state, the state of Massachusetts has its own zero waste plan, but they don't essentially have not done anything about it and, and, is, and I don't think they're even close to achieving their goals. Um, uh, reducing waste can't be the sole responsibility of individual residents, as we'll see. Uh, uh, the Board of Health has the jurisdiction over this issue, as you might be aware, and um, you have opportunity to make significant impact by taking the lead on this proposal. So um, we need to reduce the amount of trash we dispose of, uh, and, and uh, for environmental justice uh, reasons in particular. I'm going to skip over some of these slides because uh, I really want to make sure we have time for um, uh, plenty of discussion. But uh, uh, but environmental justice really is an important issue uh, f for me and 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 for all of us who are uh, who are concerned about the impact of solid waste and uh, and uh, communities that are that are disadvantaged, low income, don't have power. They don't have a seat at the table. Uh, so we can say not in my backyard, but they are not not able to make that uh, decision for themselves, and so they are often the victims uh, disproportionately of uh, public health impacts of these um, both uh, incinerators and landfills. So uh, the state, again, is, is, uh, is, not, is not really following through. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, and, and we, uh, we, th we think that the Board of Health is, is, uh, is, is doing a lot of good stuff. So uh, here are the goals of the proposed amendment uh, to reduce waste, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, add transparency and save residents money. Um, and they are the, here, these are the by, town bylaws and the uh, relevant uh, Board of Health regulations. Um, and so here are the primary elements that, uh, of the proposed amendment. Uh, to change from an indiv individual subscription service, uh, currently it's um, USA uh, hauler, um, that's uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a system that where the hauler is con has to contract with the town 
and uh, the town would be putting out bids for hauling firms with the uh, specific and the town specifying services that would be provided. So uh, the timing, uh, we're looking at uh, a pilot program that would apply to residences with four or or, or fewer families uh, in those residences to add um, uh, a third dumpster. Currently, there's the the um, the, the uh, recycling. There's the refuse. We want a third dumpster that would have organics um, and uh, so, uh, and we and eventually we hope. In fact, even immediately, we hope to be helping apartment dwellers where there are um, dumpsters uh, to also uh, be uh, recycling their organics and uh, helping them to examine how that can be done and look into how it's how that's done elsewhere. But the current uh, proposed amendment focuses on these uh, four or fewer um, uh, re families per residence. Uh, so. There, there are 12 ways that this proposed amendment will help. And the first is the most important because it's, it uh, refers to the, that third toter that I mentioned. Uh, at, at least 40, perhaps even 50% of uh, what's in a dump truck is organic and could and should be composted. It's, uh, uh, and the fact that it's not being composted, uh, the fact that it's being thrown away and either burned or buried, it adds tremendously to our uh, pollution, to our carbon footprint. Uh, and is also a waste, of course, of a good, uh, a valuable for a fertilizer. Uh, so number two, requiring uh, comp local compost processing, uh, as I mentioned, produces a, a, a valuable fertilizer. Three, a standard fee is charged for recycling and compostable materials pickup uh, in this uh, uh, proposed amendment. Pay per bag. This is very important. Um, so uh, you, uh, minimizing waste will be incentivized. Uh, if uh, if you pay less simply by putting uh, less uh, stuff in your refuse, if you recycle more, you pay less. Uh, and a preference for dual stream is uh, re recycling is available. Uh, five uh, bulky waste pickup uh, items will be they'll be picked up uh, curbside several times a year, including stu student move out and move in times. More frequent hazardous waste collection. Uh, we're asking and uh, maintenance of the transfer station option. Transportation is a wonderful um, uh, institution in, in Amherst and uh, people can save money and they can also recycle and, and divert a lot of things from the, from the waste stream uh, by being members of, of the transfer station and paying that annual fee. Uh, trans, transparent pricing of services and pickup schedule should be posted by the hauler. Uh, uh, we, uh, we want to, them to have an efficient um, um, uh, pattern of uh, pickup uh, and split body trucks are also a good idea uh, for uh, for that efficiency that you know one half being for the recyclables the other half being for the organics uh, long-term planning by the hauler for the emissions reduction from hauler vehicles and operations is advisable uh, we need to have a baseline and, and currently we have no idea how much uh, waste is being uh, taken away from Amherst on a, a daily, weekly, or, or annual basis. So we're asking that that be part of the uh, re request for a proposal that the, uh, the hauler be able to give us those figures so that we have a baseline and we can measure our progress towards zero waste. And uh, also public education should be provided by the hauler about how to recycle um, everything that you, that can be recycled. So uh, here's a, the Smith College Capstone Project uh, offers this uh, bar graph that, uh, uh, you can see on, on the, the pink bars, this is this is what happens in communities like Amherst. Uh, we, we pay a lot more. Um, uh, uh, if you don't contract out, uh, and right now, US, USA is, a, is a, essentially a monopoly. But here on the right, you can see South Hadley, Pittsfield, Longmeadow, and uh, Shootsbury. They, they're all paying a lot less because the town uh, is putting out an RFP and, and uh, hires the hauler. Uh, so... Uh, and, and again, the, about a double the average an, Amher, Amherst individual contract compared to the av, average uh, surveyed town contract, uh, we're paying about double uh, the, what the other pounds are paying. Um, so the phases of the pilot program, uh, first evaluation of, of that phase one, uh, extension to multifamily residences would follow, hopefully, and homeowners associations, extension to business and institutions as well. Uh, transition to direct services by the town uh, is, a, is a distinct possibility and might be advisable. And, and this is uh, uh, being supported by the DPW as, a, uh, um, as perhaps a desirable outcome. Uh, and uh, so 
uh, there's been a lot of support for moving to this contract model. Uh, the solid waste master plan uh, was very much focused on uh, uh, the or, uh, recycling of organics. Uh, uh, it was our top priority. Uh, and, and also moving to a pay per bag, pay as you throw uh, uh, hauler system. Uh, there's the, also the DEP technical assistance study that I mentioned earlier, and the and the Mass DEP promotes transition from subscription haulers service haulers as well. The Smith College study is in agreement with this, pro, uh, and and residents, uh, the the recycling committee did a survey as part of our townwide public education campaign, and there was a lot of enthusiasm for uh, diversion of organics and pay as you throw. Um, so uh, the, the ECAC uh, zero waste goal is, is consistent with this contract model. And also, as I mentioned, DPW staff members are uh, behind it. So in, in summary, we're requesting that the Board of Health review the ZWA's proposal to amend the BOH regulations to add a waste hauling program that will move the town towards zero waste and climate action goals, increase transparency and reduce uh, fees to residents, to cost to residents, uh, and then develop a list of questions and suggestions within, within a month, work with ZWA to finalize the amended regulations and vote to adopt the amended regulations within 90 days. And thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity Woo! to make this presentation. Wow, you're way under your 15 minutes. I'm, I'm happy to hear it. You all have the slides, so I don't think you need me to read everything verbatim. Okay, do people have questions? I have something that's, I think, very fundamentalist before we get into any of the details. So the Board of Health is five unelected people who have the responsibility that is very clearly defined by our charge. I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to read it. It's one sentence. And that responsibility for unelected people making rules that bind everyone with penalty of law has to be used very carefully because it's undemocratic, let's face it, but it is necessary because of public health. And let me just read the charge to the Board of Health. The Board of Health, this is right from the town website on the Board of Health page. The Board of Health is responsible for protection and promotion of public health, the, the control of disease and the promotion of sanitary living conditions for the town of Amherst. Health, disease, sanitation, Amherst. If we go beyond that charge, what, you know, we have places where we really do need to do this. If you were listening, you heard that a hardworking local business owner had to pay $2,000 for a single violation of the regulation. That is a state law, but there are other ones like the mask mandate that we put in. It had very difficult effect, made business difficult for some people, but it was done for an absolutely clear purpose that was within that charge. And if we go beyond that, and if we do things, and I agree 100% with what you've tried to, what you're saying, I would, I would vote for it. I actually already do compost everything except paper for recycling. I totally agree with it for all the reasons you said, but who has ever gotten sick from putting compostable materials in a landfill? Unless you can answer that, this is just not our job. Okay, it's very tempting. You know, you have a town council, they're hard to convince, Darcy's on it. Why aren't they doing it? <clears throat> you think, well, we can find five people, really just three of the five as a quorum, as a majority, and you can have something that binds people with a force of law to do something they may not want to do. So it's very important to me, at least, that this have a direct health impact, not just in the landfill as a whole. I understand toxic leachate, Leachate does not come from the compostable materials, as far as I can see. The methane is terrible. It's ridiculous that that's coming out of the landfill. Methane is absolutely inert when it comes in, in contact with living organisms. There is no biochemical process that, where methane has any effect. So this is your job, for me at least. What is the health implication? Why is there a health problem with putting compostable material in a landfill? Raising the hand. Yeah, I think. Are you able to speak? Yeah. Um, are, you, are you asking me? Yeah. Yes. Or, or are you and Ms. Someone and Ms. had a hand up. Yes, yeah. yes I, I did have my hand up, and oh, I, yes, I, I would like to respond. Um, there are uh, there are no borders, of course, when it comes to either uh, pollution or climate change. 
pollution and climate change are both existential health issues. Uh, we live in uh, a smog, uh, you know, o ozone levels. I mean, you know, that we get an F in terms of the Piney Valley, uh, in terms of our climate, uh, in terms of our uh, air quality. Uh, so uh, it's every municipality, every state shares equally in the responsibility of minimizing our waste. And yes, um, comp when, when compost, compostable materials, which again, constitute about 50% of whether, you know, whether it's thrown away uh, or whether it's, whether it's destination is an incinerator or a landfill. Um, when I was on the committee, uh, the town asked us to make a determination which of those two was a preferable option to burn or bury our waste. We were not able to make a determination. We, we, came, we came back with the statement, they're both terrible. <laughs> they both had terrible consequences. We really can't say which is worse. So uh, they, they are a public health issue uh, in, in the ways that I described. Um, they, are, they significantly contribute to a, a, car, a carbon footprint, which, which uh, you, you know, we don't have a planet B. This is, now everyone is recognizing this to be an existential health crisis. And I underlined the word health in that sentence. Um, and, and it's also a part of the, uh, a a part of the uh, uh, extinction crisis. Uh, because pollution is affecting and, and climate change is also affecting animals. Uh, and, and pollution affects, uh, uh, I don't have the figures, but it's, there are a, a, a distressing number of deaths every year worldwide that are caused by air pollution. Uh, and, and again, there's, a, there's that environmental uh, uh, justice responsibility that, every, that we have. Uh, again, we're, we're all affected, but especially the uh, environmental justice neighborhoods that that have uh, that are more likely to have those facilities in their neighborhoods. Now, we just want to say one thing here. So, you know, there's a lot of things that affect health. Warfare affects health. The Board of Health of the Town of Amherst does not do foreign policy. Poverty affects health. The Board of Health of the Town of Amherst does not have a, a way to redistribute income and wealth within the town. We have a charge, that charge is very specific and I still have not heard why putting compostable material in a landfill is, has any health consequences per se. And so that's my barrier that I still have against our doing it. And by the way, I would add another thing that I looked at the, uh, many of the, of the municipalities that have a, or many of the or, yeah, municipalities and even one state that has composting mandates. And in no case was that done by unelected health authorities or boards of health. For example, Boulder, Colorado, you mentioned in, in the materials we got, the city council voted that. The state of Vermont has a widespread composting mandate. The state legislature voted it. Seattle was one of the first, 2012. The city council voted it. And very relevant, Hamilton, Massachusetts, a community not that different in size from ours, uh, recently, within a few months ago, put in something that's very much, very similar to what you are advocating. And that was done by their select board. They have a select board instead of a council. Not, you know, they have a board of health just like we do. The board of health isn't even mentioned in their materials. It was done. And the more, the way you say it is that it's very broad. It has all these implications, global this and global that. That is all the more reason why it should be done with widespread public buy-in, either by the public as a whole or their elected representatives, town council, not by unelected un individuals who have a really specific narrow charge that they have to stick to, or else if we don't stick to it, then everybody's going to say, oh, you guys are into that. That's not really your charge. How, why should they believe the, the, the mandates and rules that we do put in that really are within our charge. Lauren, do you have anything else, Steve? Oh, John, do you have a response to that? Darcy. Yes, I just have Darcy, a do you have a response to that? Oh, Darcy, oh, and then, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. And then I'll ask more, and then Lauren, I'm going to ask Darcy for a response to Steve. And then Lauren had her hand raised before we open it up to attendees. So I'm going to have the Board of Health members ask their questions first and get responses from Darcy or John. And then I'll open it up to attendees. Yeah, I just, I, I would just say that um, uh, I have, uh, 
I guess I have a lot of respect for um, resident committees that have been appointed by the town manager. We did bring this to the town council town services and outreach committee uh, and made a couple of presentations. And one of the reactions that we had from the town councilors um, was that they felt like it was more appropriately in the board of health. And so uh, that actually is the reason why we then brought it to the board of health. Um, and also because we looked at the regulations and clearly the regulations go into great detail about um, hauler responsibilities. Um, and so that's basically why we're here. And also, you know, John's explanation of how this is, we, we definitely do see this as a public health issue. And that was, um, you know, we had, um, I don't know, maybe 12 slides about why we're in front of the Board of Health. We skipped over those slides because that was something that we were, um, we wanted to spend that much time on. Um, but those are, those are the basic reasons why we think that our Board of Health could, um, could take this opportunity to um, to take some bold action on on both zero waste and climate action, climate justice, um, and um, amend your regulations. I mean, because you are you have regulations that are specifically focused on on haulers. So, um, thank you. Any questions. Okay. Did that, uh, Steve, do you have any other question for Darcy? Okay. So Lauren? I have a question. Oh, okay. Lauren had her hand up next and then Tim. Okay. Lauren? Are you there, Lauren? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I hope my thing isn't. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, I hope my thing doesn't cut off, but um, I, I, wanted just to ask a few basic questions. Um, like, are you asking the, the Board of Health just to write up a mandate um, from your presentation? Um, I wasn't sure if I understood if the pilot program, is it going to be just for homeowner residents? You said something about like um, colleges like Smith College. Are you looking to, to work with uh, the colleges on their um, zero waste on, on an approach to zero waste or is it and what about the the residents who live in a car, apartment complexes the dumpsters um, it is a public health issue or a health issue when you know the the trash smells you know bad and if there was a way to separate the the disposable food from you know regular trash maybe that could cut down on that, but I basically was not clear on what you were act actually asking the Board of Health to do, and would that actually bring? How would how would that then um, bring in the project to the different residents or the different um, colleges that you wanted to um, to work with and. Also, the, the last thing I want to do, there's a lot of things going on in my head, but the last thing I wanted to ask is, um, like, I like to compare things, like the, the guest that was talking about the well application, and uh, we asked if, you know, was the horse manure going to affect the water? And so I think it could be, like, the same argument that, you know, even though, you know, food is contained in a... In, in a place where it, it might not get into different, get into soil or get into water, it's still, you know, a quality issue. And that's just what's on my, I don't know if that is helpful at all, but. Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, and it's a really good question. Um, basically, we, we are asking the Board of Health to amend their hauler regulations and that to create this pilot program, the 
first phase of which would just apply to one to four family residences. The reason why we decided to focus on that first is because it's much easier to get it started with that because res you know the single family residences have toters and toters are easier to to start you know start uh, an immediate program whereas the apartment complexes and the businesses um, have dumpsters or some variation of dumpsters and that is going to take more time to figure out how that will work although I think that that apartment dwellers are going to immediately want to be part of this and so I think that there should be an effort to immediately you know have focus groups at apartment complexes to try to figure it work out what the problems are you know do they need to be you know toters or dumpsters do they need to be in a cage do they need to be uh you know a, a lot of different issues which i think the people who live at the apartment complexes would want to weigh in on um and so that's what we're hoping for that you know the, the that we could get started with the first phase and at the same time we could uh work with apartment dwellers on the second phase to see how that <coughs> and colleges same thing that's a later phase the you know institutions in town and the businesses um and because they are going to be more complicated and they might be a year or two down the road to do that piece does that answer your question, Lauren? Um, Lauren? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Tim, you had questions? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm also uh, not convinced uh, if, if it has direct relevance to public health, unless you can provide evidence. In a, one is, uh, I know that uh, hauler regulations are essentially meant to avoid trash accumulations having a direct impact on public health, right on spot, right, on site. Um, sorting trash into compostable papers and everything looks like it's a solid waste management issue, uh, which should not be some sort of a, a under the jurisdiction or regulation of the public board of health. Um, I think you listed some few impacts like methane emissions, leachates from the landfill. Uh, those are usually regulated by the DEP through their monitoring services and everything. So if there is um, any type of violations, usually the, the landfill operators are usually uh, uh, managed through that regulations. So I'm just, I, I just, I'm again reiterating uh, Stephen's question on why it is a board, you know, board of health's uh, jurisdiction rather than a town council or even DPW's. Uh, DPW manages the water, drinking water quality, wastewater treatment, everything, and we don't do much regulations on how much they should treat wastewater. You see what I mean? So right. I think that there is there should be a very right. clarity on few things, and then also climate issues. That's a global phenomenon. Um, and we are very less powerful people only having a jurisdiction with Amherst, town of Amherst. So, uh, so be going beyond these boundaries is a much more broader issue. Uh, we would like to reduce methane emissions. We would like to reduce uh, leachates. Uh, and uh, I think if, if we can find some specific disease impact uh, direct type of a health impacts, which is actually, if you can find this many people are sick because of this, I think that will be a direct um, motivation for the Board of Health to be intervened. So uh, just asking that question. Um, I believe that it would be possible to come up with figures about uh, illnesses and deaths that are attributable to pollution uh, in general, and that and the extent that incinerators and landfills contribute to that uh, pollution is is considerable. Uh, so, and as I mentioned, there are no boundaries uh, when it comes to air pollution. 
So uh, we are uh, the town of Amherst. Now, uh, it would be very difficult, of course, to come up with figures to demonstrate how Amherst residents in particular are impacted. And um, it would be an impossible after all, I mean, to come up with those figures. However, the, the larger picture, there's no question, absolutely no question that, um, that pollution is a public health issue um, and that we are being affected. Uh, there's certainly no question in the town of Springfield, which is the asthma capital, you know, uh, that where the uh, pollution is terrible. But Amherst is is not that far behind. As, as my understanding is that the air quality can be pretty uh, uh, abysmal here as well. Uh, so uh, I, I I appreciate your concern, and I appreciate. It. I mean, it would be great to have those statistics, wouldn't it? It would be great to say, well, this is how uh, Amherst residents are being affected. But there's no question that we are being affected, uh, and uh, and it's also I think the responsibility of the Board of Health to anticipate what those impacts will be in the future. And if, uh, as is the case, the more we go down this path and the less uh, responsibility municipalities take in limiting uh, uh, refuse uh, uh, disposal, uh, which with the uh, impacts that it has on pollution and, clim and uh, climate and everything else, the more, uh, the more these problems will uh, intensify uh, and, and become even, even more severe. Uh, can I follow, uh, have a follow-up question? Uh, uh, I agree, I think air pollution has a huge impact. Water quality has a big impact. I'm trying to look for some link between air pollution and composting. So uh, the, the, the relevant question is here is, is it possible to divert 50% of what's in those dump trucks that's destined to either be burned or buried? The answer simply is yes. So diversion of organics is number one, and then uh, making that into compost is another side benefit. But but the primary responsibility is getting it, keeping it out. This is that's why I joined the recycling refuse management committee. And it's like this doesn't make sense. You know, people throwing away so much that should be diverted from the waste stream, and the fact that it's not diverted from the waste stream, the fact that it's it included that it goes to those, you know, that it's incinerated, that means that, there, that we've got double. Uh, roughly double the amount of pollution that we should be having if the if that amount of refuse was not being diverted. Maureen, do you uh, have any questions? I don't have a question, but I guess I was thinking we already have regulations that mandate recycling of right. in mixed containers and paper. Mm -hmm. And um I don't know how those evolved to become public, public board of health regulations, but we do have them and we've been enforcing them for years. Uh, perhaps that came from the era when we actually had landfills in town and had, you know, had more pressure to reduce the, mm -hmm. the amount of uh, uh, materials going into that landfill. I don't, I don't really know. It, it, this, Although I agree, it feels a little funny that here we are, a little Board of Health kind of making these bigger recommendations. It feels more like an extension of the regulation that we already have to me right. than kind yeah. of de novo. And so I, I, I don't know. I mean, that, that's, that, that, that's just um, what I see. Um, so that, um, I don't know where that authority came from to be honest, <laughs> um, but it seems like we do have that authority, so. Okay, so I, I have some, uh, did you have another question, Tim? And then I have some comments. Did you have another question, Tim? Um, I, I think uh, Lauren has a question, I think. Lauren, do you have another yeah, question? I, yeah, I have a brief one. I just, I'm just trying to understand better in my mind, but isn't, pollution and trash two different things just because it's in a trash heap and you want to separate the compo com compostable um you know material from the non-compostable that's not necessarily it's not a pollution problem yet it's, oh, it's just uh, a trash yes. issue so the, the the way we see it is that pollution happens because we're throwing away so much and if we can uh, reduce by half the amount of stuff that we're throwing away, and uh, whether it's being incinerated or going to a landfill, 
we have these pollution issues coming. So uh, just imagine if we were thro throwing away half as much as, as currently is the case, uh, that, was, that should um, cut the pollution in half from, uh, you know, from, from, from the, uh, there, of course, there are different sources of pollution. There, there are other you know, exhaust from vehicles and all that. Uh, and incidentally, that could, could also be reduced in terms of the, the number of trucks uh, uh, carrying away that, uh, that refuse, which is often uh, trucked uh, hundreds of miles away. It, it all depends on uh, what the contract is that the hauler decides that they want to make, um, where they want to take their trash and who's giving them the best deal. Uh, so the less, uh, the less we can send away to be in, in burned or buried, the better off we are. That's the bottom line. And in terms of that, that's the, the pollution um, consequence of throwing away too much trash. I'll, I'd also want to point out that, that there are two major parts of this proposal, the first being diversion of organics, but the second being pay per bag pay as you throw, which is an incentive to throw away less. If you're paying, if you're, if you're being charged less, uh, 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 because you have a smaller toter or your toter is, uh, uh, you know, they, don't, they only have to come every month instead of every week. Uh, that's an incentive for people to throw away less. And, uh, and often it's, uh, that, that results in a 30 to 40% reduction typically. And it's immediate, it's, it's, it's dramatic. Municipalities across the state have experienced this, an immediate dramatic effect uh, as soon as pay per bag pays you throw is instituted. Uh, so uh, that's that's the other main part of this proposal, um, and and both parts are all about reducing waste. Of course, in re reducing com consumption in the first place. You might be familiar with three R's, or actually there are four: Refru refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. And then, by far, the most important are the first two: refuse, reduce. So, uh, and it's been found that consumers actually. Uh, uh, people actually consume less and therefore generate less trash and less uh, pr pollution, which happens every step along the way when you can, when you produce an item and then consume it and throw it away or, or re recycle it for that matter. Uh, people actually consume less in the first place, uh, surprisingly, uh, when they're motivated to, uh, and, and they can save money by doing so. So this is a, a part of a, a, a society-wide move in the direction of living, living more simply and living more responsibly. Okay, so I'm going to say a few things now. Um, um, from a public health point of view, um, the Institute of Medicine had several very important reports out in 1988 and 2003 talking about how bad the U.S. is doing with public health. And they, they put the ecological model as a model and the state uses this and we use this as the model to promote public health. Um, and and I, I see this as an environmental justice issue. Where is our trash going? Okay, do we wanna look at nimbyism? Okay, we don't have to deal with enamors cause it's going someplace. But it used to go to Partika in Chicopee, which then has repercussions for us. Uh, it's, I don't know where it's going, but it has repercussions yeah. for other people. Um, how we work on this, I, I, I don't know, but I, I see it as an important piece in public health now, because it, it and I, I, I think, and I know what's happening in town, we used to have it, you could bring it to the dump. Then you had, okay, you have to have it picked up and you got the little stickers, you know, those little pieces of cardboard, remember that? And you could bring six things to town. Well, now you have to pay $125 to get in that gate, I think. And I know people who now that we've switched to this say, oh, if you use black bags, you can put all your, your yard waste because there's no place else to put it. And people are throwing that stuff out. And people are dumping things other places. I know a lot of my yard waste goes to my daughter's house because she has lots of woods, but there's no place. So we're, we don't have something and, and it, it, it's hidden in town. Um, I have friends in California. I've been very aware and can't figure out for the past seven years, every time I go to Martinez or Los Gatos, California, this is what they're doing. 
point blank, why aren't we doing it? What towns in Massachusetts are doing it? And how did they get it in place? And um, I, I do look at it as an overall public health issue when you look at the ecological model. And um, whether we have to work with the town council to come up with this, whether we have to work with the DPW, but I think it is a public health issue. And um, it is an, a complete environmental justice issue, especially if you looked in the 60s and 70s, what had happened down south. And where is our trash going? Where are we polluting? Um, okay, you know, we won't even put solar panels on our old dump. But, um, but, but I think whether we take the action or we work with other people in town to take the action, I, I, I think it is a public health issue. Um, Nancy, are there comments? Two, yes? There, there are two people with hands up. Yes, now I was gonna open it to public health. Oh, comments. okay. Do you want me to do that or? Yes, please. Okay, so um, Elaine, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Um, Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think you should be hearing me now. Um, so good evening, and, and I appreciate the, the time. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I volunteered to report back to the League of Women Voters about what's going on with zero waste. I had started to join the group back in 2020, but I didn't think they were well organized. And Darcy has sent me some, some emails, and I think they've gotten a, along the way a little bit better. Um, so so basically, listening to all your concerns, I, uh, it's nice to actually see who the Board of Health is and to hear some of your comments. And uh, as Mr. George first pointed out, he was trying to figure out how exactly this has to do with you. Well, you know, once again, it's there, section one of the regulations. And as Nancy, as you pointed out, the other issues involved, it's very much the, in the is it aegis of the, the Board of Health to take this up. Uh, zero Waste has done a lot of work in two years trying to get this together. Um, and let's see, I don't know if possibly you can champion this and lob it over to the town council when the new one is elected and carry on with this. Now, I mean, your, your concern with what does this have to do with health? Well, all those questions have been answered and will be answered again. Um, they're in the presentation. You all know it. We know it too. And I guess the, the real issue is, you know, <clears throat> when can we begin doing this? It's very important. And um, okay, I don't wanna take any more of your time, but thank you, that's what I had to say. Thank you. And Sam have... Gladstone has okay. his hand up. Okay, so Sam, are you able to speak if you unmute? Samuel? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just wanna summarize it's a couple of things uh, for me. So there, there seems to be question. Can are you, are you hearing me, or is there a problem? Yeah. You are hearing uh, it. So I'm just getting some strange feedback. Are you hearing that? Yes. We hear a little bit of feedback, but we're getting you. It's it's uh, hard to talk with that. Uh, so. Just to the, the pollution, if you put it in a, a landfill, our stuff goes somewhere. Methane is created. It's 80 times more worse than carbon dioxide. We can't, we can't say somebody else is going to deal with climate change. Everybody's got to deal with climate change. It affects all our health. Um, and if you burn it, just like John said, we have a huge asthma problem uh, in, in Amherst uh, and, and we already have, have uh, problems. Uh, wherever that goes, we have to take responsibility. It's our waste. And there is a history on the Board of Health in Amherst of, of being out front. We, when I was on the, the co-chair, we were the first town in, in Massachusetts to stop allowing smoking in bars. It was outrage. There, people were outraged. It was a huge fight, 
you can't smoke in any bar anywhere now. There's no reason for you not to take the lead. It sounds like you have been asked to take the lead by the town council. And I would, I would really encourage you to be brave and move forward. This, is, this does have to do with everybody's health. And uh, I think it's really important to, to take this on. And it's not gonna happen. There's a lot of work that's gonna have to be done, but you have people to work with who will help you in, in this process. And so I just wanna really thank you all. I know what it's like to be on a board of health. It's a lot of work. And I, I thank you for, for doing it and for listening, letting me talk. Thank you. Any other comments from attendees? That's it. Or hands up. Whose hands up? But that, that's it. No more. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I didn't see any hands up. Can I ask a question from the presenters? Um, a month ago, before the last meeting, I did some preparation for this issue, and I can't remember. But I thought I saw at least a few examples where the Board of Health took the lead on this. And I just wonder if you have examples of the Board of Health of a town um, or city taking the lead on this issue. Uh, I don't have any examples, um, but, but as, as, um, as people have been observing, the Board of Health definitely has re responsibility for managing refuse and recycling, and and you already have regulations. So, uh, we're talking about whether the regulations are adequate, and whether they can be improved. And that's our proposal. Uh, it's it's um, it's it's definitely uh, uh, specified to be a board of health responsibility. But, but no, I, I don't have an answer to that question of which what, you. You know, other other board of health uh, boards of boards of health have done this. You, Darcy, or. Well, we know, we know that in Massachusetts, this, this would be taking the lead and that Hamilton was the first town in Massachusetts to uh, ban organics in the waste stream. Um, and that was just, you know, a few months ago. Uh, we, we, we have talked to the, to the people in Hamilton and gotten a lot of good information from them, but that, that was through their select board. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the only um that's the only town in massachusetts that i know of that has compost curbside compost collection in basic service yeah another comment i could make about the uh, responsibility of the boh is that uh, the regulations as has been commented uh, as um, there are actually supposed to be consequences for violation of uh, of con contamination of refuse with the recycling uh, 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 recyclables, uh, and it's called contamination for good reason, uh, because it does have those public health uh, and pollution con um, results. Um, unfortunately, it's an unenforced mandate. Uh, there, there are no. I mean, I think that the, uh, responsibilities for enforcement are supposed to be shared by the police and by the board of health, and the board of health just doesn't have the resources, and the police doesn't have it on there. You know, and so it's an unenforced mandate. But, but the fact that these um, penalties are part of the regulations indicate how important uh, someone at some point decided that they were. Well, I would like to make a comment about that. I mean, I think a regulation, that, that just shows the difficulty here. If we make a regulation, it has to be not only enforceable, but actually enforced or else it's a joke. It's just a gesture. Oh, we're saying it's re legally required okay. to pretend that it's important. So that, that if we're can gonna I, go I, ahead with it as a board of health, at least if the town can do what it wants and I would support the town doing this, but if the board of health does it, there better be a, a way. We have you know one and a half health inspectors, or maybe two, something like that. It's a very small number of inspectors who would be available to do this. And I don't know if the trash haulers could be held uh, to do that, but that is a very important thing. It has to be enforceable right. and actually enforced. Okay, could, could I comment on that, please? Uh, yes. So our, our proposal does not suggest that we should focus right, right now on enforcement. The only reason I brought up enforcement was to point out 
that uh, some some you know at initially when these regulations were were promulgated, uh, it was they were viewed as being important enough to have penalties. But our proposal is not proposing, you know, our proposal has nothing to do with the stick. It's all about carrots right now. It's all about uh, setting up a system where people have the opportunity to throw away organics. We're not, we're not going to, we're not proposing that they be charged or penalized. We are incentivizing though, because if they do, if they use their compost bins, then they will throw away less and they'll spend less money. So why it's you need all regulate. Why do you need a regulation? I love that. Why do, why do you need a regulation? You're saying well, you want to do it voluntarily. Let them do it. Make it possible. Because currently, currently there is no option of of compost re organics recycling. Currently, okay. uh, there there is uh, actually through USA, well, okay. but it costs fifteen dollars extra per month, right? Which makes right. it like like you know a six fifty or seven hundred dollars for for a trash. Um, so. It's not very practical and it's very hard to find out about it too. It, you know, I, I actually was curious about it and I tried to look at the USA website. There's nothing on it about any rates, anything. And yeah, I sure. contacted them um, and they told me, yes, I could do it, but it would cost an extra $15 right. a month. Right. And my, yeah. my neighbor yeah. does that. Yeah. Um, if you want to recycle your organics, you can do so by becoming a transfer station member and paying that fee, annual fee. Mm -hmm. You can also have a compost bin in your backyard if you have the wherewithal yeah, to do yeah. that. But, but uh, realistically, uh, I think it's a safe assumption that if we offer that third bin and if there is that incentive to use it, uh, because people will realize that by using it, they'll, they will spend less, then, then we should dramatically, and also, you know, the pay, so the combination of those two things should dramatically reduce the amount of of of, uh, of stuff that goes in the, the, that that refuse, whether it's recyclables or organics, either one. I don't think that's what the proposal says. I mean, if, if that's what it says, that you're going to require the hauler to provide an opportunity, right? That to, to me is that certainly, yeah. Whether the Board of Health should still, well, then the Board of Health, you're just not requiring anything. The Board of Health need to make a regulation. Well, That'd be fine. I, I, I don't know. Uh, you, there might be a misunderstanding there. No, we are, we are proposing that um, the R, an RFP would require three toters for residences. And then, um, you know, Residents would immediately get get that if they if they put uh, their organics in the organics bin, that would reduce the other bin, the trash bin that they're paying for, by up to half. And so um, that uh, we we have heard. I know that um, that in Boulder and Louisville, Colorado, they do this, and that um, residents who get started in the program, you know, they immediately figure out, even if they had no idea about anything about compost, you know, they figure it out very quickly um, what goes in each bin and that if they're charged according to what's in the trash bin, then uh, they reduce it. They put it in the other bins. Warren, did you have your hand up again? Yes, sorry, I just have one other question. Um, uh, for clarification, um, I need to excuse me. Um, would the like for for from my understanding, whether it's 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 a mandate or RFP to as you said, um, have a third bin for people to use for um, food compost. With, without that, people can still compost their um, their food if they if they so choose to um, on a small scale. Like for example, I have uh, you know I have we have a garden here at where we live at apartment complex where we live, and I've been doing a compost bin, but it does attract flies. It does attract, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. smell if you don't yeah. cover it, you know, all that stuff. So I still don't, I still don't have the answer as to where is this going to be dumped? Where, how, how is it, where is it going to go? Uh, so uh, 
that would uh, that would be figured out. Uh, ideally, uh, it'll go someplace locally. There is a place in Greenfield. Uh, hopefully, we could have something even more local, even uh, even closer to Amherst. Uh, but we do know that uh, uh, there's a, a, a compost facility in Greenfield where it can go. And I guess I have a question is who's doing all the work to figure out the RFP and make these plans for the composting and where does that fall in town government? Uh, Darcy, you should know these things. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, um, Zero Waste Amherst is, is willing to, you know, volunteer a lot of time helping to figure this out and um, you know, otherwise it would be, you know, probably the finance department would need to do some work on figuring out uh, how to set up the fee system. Um, and um, uh, uh, the procurement office would probably be helping with uh, writing the RFP. So, but like I said, we, you know, we, we can do a lot of the work. The volunteers can do a lot of the work um, if we get the go ahead. Because yeah, the RFP would, it will be a challenge, but we have examples. Like we have examples for, from other towns that have um, contract systems, uh, Agawam, South Hadley and so on. So, um, you know, they have their RFPs. This would be different because we'd have different requirements, but um, uh, it's, it's doable. It's clearly the health department doesn't have the abilities to put the wheels in motion. You know, they don't have the expertise or the personnel to do that. Yeah, um, I think that it would be yeah, it would be a it would be a coordinated effort between department, definitely. Okay, so Darcy, who would be involved? Okay, so the Board of Health, you're looking to write a regulation, but this also involves the DPW, um, possibly the town council. Who who should be involved in this process? I'm not. Uh, well, I think that. The, probably the first thing that needs to be done is some kind of a financial analysis and that could be done by staff. Um, uh, I think that that is the, the we, we have not been able to do that because we don't have any baseline data. And um, to find out exactly how much it would cost uh, residents would basically require the town to put out an RFQ and see what, what came out of the bids. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that would, that would be probably the peer procurement office and, um, you know, obviously zero waste Amherst could help with that too. Different towns like Hamilton uses a, you know, they, they have put the cost of their program in the town taxes. Um, we thought it would, the Colorado and Louisville, Colo uh, Boulder, Boulder and Louisville, Colorado have it set up in a fee that comes to the resident with a water bill. Um, and that seemed preferable, um, but it would obviously be worked out, you know? That, that that would require some some working out is it is it my understanding the thought was you could opt out of this by you're taking care of it yourself to take it to the transfer station yes or yes not? that would that would continue be the to be the case you can you can uh, uh pay your 125 a year and take all of your refuse and your recycling and your compostables uh, and anything else that you have that can be diverted from the waste stream um, you know, uh, you you can do that, and that would be that would continue to be the case. Lauren, do you have a question? Yes. Um, do uh, does the zero waste um, initiative? Do they know how many residents in Amherst 
um, compost now or like, I don't know what an RFQ is, but do you have an idea? Like you, the, the numbers are kind of vague and I just, yeah, no, I, I was just wondering. Right, we don't have any data from USA uh, as far as how many customers they have that voluntarily get curbside compost pickup. They do offer it, but it's voluntary. Uh, it's just opt-in. Yeah. And we, we don't know, you know, we would have no way of knowing how many people do it in their backyards. Um, okay. Yeah, you, Stephen Lord, George you have... does it, I do it. How do you find out who, who does it in their own yard? Mm -hmm. Right. Lauren, you asked what an RFP, it stands for request for proposal. So an RFP would be put out um, by the town uh, in inviting haulers to submit their, uh, um, you know, if uh, indicate their interest and then RFQ is a re request for quotes. You know, this is what we would charge for the services that you are saying that you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're at 638. So we need to figure out what our next steps are going to be. Um, I'm willing to send an email to, to Cheryl Sabara again, Mass Association of Public Health, and ask her what she knows is the trend statewide and find out what's happening that way. I'm already going to send her a um, an email on, on something else. Um, board, where do you see us going? I, I really think this is something the town should do. And I just don't see it still as being something the Board of Health should do at all by itself. I mean, if we had total buy-in from the council and they said, this is from, we want this done, but since you have some kind of jurisdiction over trash, you will, will help we, we're going to do the financing part and so on we agree to that then we'll put it in the proposal in the regulations that are uh, you know ostensibly from the board of health but it has to have town buy-in and especially because of the staffing and so on and i certainly would be willing to talk to the counselors or whatever i could do to, to try to facilitate that because this is definitely something we should do i just still don't think <laughs> the board of health should by itself unelected people put this in a regulation and i, I really like to know, by the way, where the mandate for the paper and container recycling came from. I, I'm kind of surprised that it could have come from the Board of Health if it did, but I'd like to, I wonder how we can find that out. Where did, how did, when did that start and how did, it, where, how did it arise? Because it would give a precedent, even though I think it's weird that the Board of Health would do it because it doesn't seem to have anything to do with health at all, though it's great that we do it. So where did it come from? I think it's consistent across the state all, that all municipalities uh, give the Board of Health that, that authority and responsibility. Uh, mandatory recycling, okay. Yeah, it's also I, I, back to uh, the eight, late 80s. 80s, and then, the late and then, 80s, yeah. And then uh, uh, revised the last in 2014. Um, and, and also, Steve, when you said uh, not only the town council, but the DPW, I see it as the DPW, the health board of health and the town council. So now how do we, Darcy, you're on the town council. How do we go forward? And also, oh, I wanted to tell the, the board members, we had four emails today supporting this. Um, from from town residents so there there has been support and there are also other attendees i don't know if they're and supporting health, this or against this yeah. but they're also there. I, could, I could mention that we've had consistent support from hitchcock center for the environment and um and league of women voters for these initiatives okay so darcy you brought this forward to the to the board of health you are a town counselor how do you advise us working uh, clearly together with the town council and the DPW. Yeah, uh, would it be possible for this board to request um, the town manager or DPW, probably the town manager to um, come up with um, a 
some kind of financial analysis of um, how this could work because regardless of where it goes, whether it goes here or whether it goes to the town council or wherever, um, people want to know how much will this cost? Yes. Uh, and the, line. <laughs> the only way that we can find that out um, is by putting out an RFQ and having some two or three haulers come back to us and say, this is what we would charge you for this. Um, you know, this is what a contract would cost. Um, and so that, I mean, I, don't, I guess we can't really know what the numbers are until we do that. And we can't do that until uh, someone comes up with that RFQ. And, and um, you know, like I said, we would be able to help by providing some samples, but it would have to come out of the procurement office, I'm pretty sure. So, but if you, if this board could encourage the town manager, say, you know, we're interested in this, we're not um, sure what, to re what direction to take or whatever right now, but we think that this is something that would need to be done in order for anybody to decide um, to go forward, um, because you know we do we do need the financials. I would be willing to work with you, Darcy, to come up with this that I can bring to the board for our next meeting to discuss okay. and go forward with asking for the. What do you think of that, board members? And then I will also ask Cheryl Sabara, um, what else is happening statewide? So um, can I? So sure, go for I it. I mean, whether it is taken by the town council or DPW, looks like an economic analysis should be done. Right. And and if if so, I think it has to be initiated by those who have the money to invest in, right? which is the town council or I mean thing is this this aspect of um, recycling is universally accepted as an important one everyone agrees that it's a really important one uh, waste waste is you know zero waste is a no-brainer but thing is uh, and if <clears throat> if it has to be started by board of health I think uh, one of the thing is I still have a weak argument for health impacts. I know um, Nancy mentions the ecological model, but the ecological model has a, has some sort of boundaries. You know, if we can have a whole ecosystem of the earth system, then it becomes appropriate for us to make a decision. So here we are given a mandate of a boundary limit of Amherstown. <laughs> you see, you know, that is the biggest limitation what we have, and, and so I think since uh, it is a behavioral change for every individual of a citizen of, of the town of Amherst. It has to be a democratic process which has to come from town council. So, Lauren. Sorry, I just Lauren? have another comment. Yeah, I have a comment and a question. Um, I just, uh, I feel like why is it on the the taxpayers, and even though I'm not a homeowner, I just don't understand why you're starting there. I, I mean, this is a college town. Many people have said that the universities and the, the colleges don't really contribute to the town budget. So I don't understand why you don't start with huge institutions and approach them instead of going individually to because right, taxpayers. Because right I, now, I think that Lauren, right now, trash every individual household has to pay for their trash whether you have somebody come and pick it up or whether you take it to the town dump it has nothing to do with the colleges it's each individual residence and so that's where we have to start i don't think you have I, to start there but i'll end it there no i think i, I, think you, I the I can, university has a pretty good program of uh compostable yeah. waste uh, management where they I used to get compost from them, but then they decided they needed it all for themselves. So <laughs> they use it on, uh, for what they need on campus. I think they, they're they pretty responsible in this area. Although I don't know the details. I think I want to follow up on Lauren's questions. I, I think it ha she has a point, you know. Um, 
why there are big institutions relative to some individual contributions, uh, why are we not asking them to do it? I think that is probably what the question Lauren is asking. And I think UMass has a really good um, solid waste management, um, uh, MS College asset. Uh, so institutionally they have a buy-in because there is a big in incentive for showing as a campus as sustainable. There, um, uh, there actually is currently yeah. uh, a, a statewide mandate that uh, in, that um, businesses, whether they're uh, you know grocery stores or restaurants or what have you, that have uh, a, a significant amount of organic waste, that they must divert that waste from the from the waste stream. So there's already uh, that's and that's that was always understood to be the first step uh, towards uh, uh, moving in the in the direction of making that available. Um, uh, for everyone to divert, divert organics, but that, that's already happening uh, with with large um, uh, producers of organic waste. Yeah, that's mostly the food waste. So mm -hmm. food that's waste right. essentially goes that's to right. uh, a big yeah. organic farm. That's right. On the other side of the river. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a um, it's it's a really nice idea. Sure. But the thing is, you know, when we are asking families who are already paying very high amount for <laughs> disposal and then definitely i think our our disposal cost is going to increase under the 20 20 dollars or 30 dollars right um, but so I'm, I'm just thinking you know uh, even if it's done by the town you know it might be another issue in, in terms of economics I, I think that's where i think if we could do the economic analysis and see if it's affordable um, given the cost you know and and i think that's the first step to go and definitely i think this is a democratic process it has to come from town council okay yeah i i think that um that we are hoping that it will cost um less than what people are paying now uh based on what we see with other towns contracted services and hoping that the additional services won't bring us up over that differential um that is the hope but we won't know you know unless we get we get some bids from from haulers, um, probably Republic, Casella, and um, USA are the most likely ones to bid. Okay, we're at, I I, I don't yeah, want to cut this off. We're at at ten of seven. Yeah, I'm sorry. A lot more to go on. Okay, sorry. board, what do you want for our next step to be? Steve, Tim, Maureen. Well, and I agree with you. Know, ask the town. We, we have to have some interaction with the town council and the town manager to say, I would say, this is not something that the Board of Health is ever going to mandate on our own. Because like what Tim said, it has to be done with buy-in from elected representatives. And so we want, we're asking the council and I guess the town manager to, to help out with the first steps to get the economic analysis. Yeah, the town, the town council, the town manager has the authority to do that on his own. Um, and so, and we, we have had discussions with him about doing that and he seemed open, open to going ahead and doing it, you know, so. so we need to send a letter to the town manager. And we, we need the council. To, yeah. the, the council. Town manager, town council. We need to get this letter written. I'm willing to draft it, Tim and Lauren. Who else, anyone would like to, Maureen? Anybody want to do this, or shall I send do, draft something and send it to my colleagues on the council and on the uh, board of health and see what you think? Yes, Darcy. Do you want? Do you have any guidance for this letter? Um, just that, like I said, I already brought it to the town services and they send it to you. So I, I personally think that the main entity that we need to interact with right now is for that you need to interact with. Us. Okay, so Steve, do you, want to draft, do you want to draft a letter asking for the economic analysis, send it out to us and we will discuss it and vote on it at our next meeting to send to the town manager with a CC to the town council. Sounds good. Sounds like a start. We need a motion on this. Don't need it. We're all we all agree. 
Okay, but we don't need to vote on it. Wait a minute, we better make a motion. Okay, I make a motion that we draft a letter to the town manager with the CC to the town council to begin an economic analysis of moving to uh, the zero waste management. Any comments, discussion? Uh, uh, should that include some more information beyond economic analysis? Because about the questions about how many people are ill or you know some sort of a statistics behind it in the analysis? Or are you just they're they're economic not analysis? Have that. I, I have looked no, through I'm, the, I'm, looked I'm, through I'm the world. I'm just saying, you know, the, right, the There's economic analysis, yeah. if they can provide some additional details, you know, if possible, you know, because they're going to have a RFQs, right? Uh, with a waste haulers, is that right? Uh, Tim, do you want to work with um, Steve on the letter? Two people can, can work. Yeah. No, yep. I just, I'm not clear about what is the economic analysis involved. It, is it only the hauling cost we are in, interested in that well, you probably want you'd probably want to know um, uh, you'd probably want an RFQ, and you probably would want a some kind of analysis of um, staffing needed to um, to have the fee system put in place and maintained. Right, staffing and within, in the town. Right, within the town, there would need to be someone in charge of the fee system. Mm -hmm. um, so that. And it's, and it's important that the R, when the RFQ goes out, it specifies the elements of the, of the proposal to include both the third total for organics and the pay, uh, you know, paying uh, for the amount. I mean, there'll be a set fee that you, that everyone will pay, but those who uh, throw out a lot less refuse will be, will be charged less. John and Darcy, why don't you write that paragraph? Just one succinct paragraph saying that. Okay, just that part of it, because that's some details. What exactly is the economic analysis, the RFQ aiming for? I mean, I can try it, but I think you should do it. Just a one paragraph. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. That is it's, the it's, email it to me, I'll, I'll look you up, Darcy, and I'll send you an email. So you know my email, okay? And it, we can do that definitely. And it's all in the amendment to the regulations. You know, we put it all in there. What it's what's there? there. Okay. Uh, yeah. we, we, can, we can send it to you. Okay. So the, okay. So Steve will get the re draft letter written. We'll get it before the meeting. Then in our next meeting, we will go over it, and then we will vote on sending it to the town manager with CC to the count, town council. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So much of your time. That was more than 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for your work. I may have muted them. Or they're they're back in as attendees. Okay. Whew. Okay. Director's report. Okay, so I'm just gonna quickly go over the review of the COVID data um, and how it pertains to our mask order. I think everyone's been following along our dashboard on the town webpage, but right now we're at 26 active cases. Um, back in November, let's see, September 16th, our last meeting, we are at 357. So everything was pretty calm in June and July. So September 1st, it started going up. Um, so we're leveling off, we're, we're lowering, our numbers are coming down. Um, our incidence, 14 day incidence rate is um, down 17.4. I expect tomorrow when it's published by the state, it'll be lower. Again, back um, in September, it was 97.5. So we're going the right direction. Um, I'd like to keep the mask order in place. Um, I know I've said this a few times, but COVID isn't necessarily known as a um, seasonal respiratory virus, but I think it's just 
with people coming together um, with colder weather, I really like to keep the mask order in place and just sort of ride this out. It's working well. Um, so that's my, my quickie COVID um, data. Does anyone want anything more? Or no, I just all? wanted to comment that I, I was traveling to California. I got home, tested negative. Okay. But out there in the whole Bay Area, you have to show your immunization report even to eat outside. And there's signs all over, no mask, no service. Yeah, yeah. And when you flew in uh, in Burbank, they had, oh, come to the TSA station number, blah, 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 and get your vaccination. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty, uh, yeah. uh, was, yeah. was pretty well handled out there. Yeah, Just thanks for sharing. FYI. Yeah. Okay, go on. Okay, so that's a quick, quick little uh, report. Um, over other COVID topics, our community COVID testing program went into action this past Tuesday. Um, thank you, UMass, for allowing us to be a satellite. So what is going on is we're um, distributing PCR test kits here at the Bangs Community Center. You can walk in the south entrance, which is the entrance closest to Johnny's. We're open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can get a test kit. They're also being distributed at the Jones Library so you can go and get um, some kits there. And if you haven't done it, they um, come in this little bag. It's a tube and it's um, a nasal swab. I submitted one this morning. I put it in the drop box at the Bangs Community Center at 9 a.m. And I get, got my test results an hour ago. So they really do a great turnover, a great job. Um, very happy with that program. So this is day four. So we have things going on, but we're talking about program evaluation and what can we do to distribute these out to the community a little bit more. So we have some folks in the know coming in, but how can we get these out to, to different people and make sure everyone's aware. Um, some information is in Spanish, but we really need to up our game into other languages and, and distribute them further. Um, the COVID vaccine, the clinics, um, the times I was getting up during the meeting, I was speaking to Lillian, who works here. Our um, clinic was going on here at the Bang Center. So we're doing walk-ins first and second. You can sign up and register for first and second. We're also doing that third dose to people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised. And we're doing boosters if you're six months out. So I think the final word I heard was about 75. So we did 13,000 shots this spring. We're not going to be doing everybody. Um, we're, we don't have that ability, but the thing is that people can get them in other places. And I do think that's what's happening. So we didn't have everyone's, you know, all 100 spots signed up for. Our vaccine rate is for um, at least um, one dose, um, assuming the state percentage is at 77%. Um, more data comes out tomorrow. We'll see if we nudge up to 78, but I'm very happy about that. The schools, I believe, um, for the uh, those who can be vaccinated are at 80%, but they have the vaccine mandate um, that uh, we all are aware of. And we're starting those clinics up um, in uh, October 29th. Um, and November 19th, we'll go into the schools and vac vaccinate folks that haven't been vaccinated, those 12 and up. And we're ready to go with five and uh, older. I think they were saying that November 22nd or something, they're voting on uh, that age range. Now, I was watching oh. CDC today. Did Moderna come out that you need a booster for Moderna? I was watching and I didn't hear the final. Yeah. So that. it looked. It looked like that went ahead. The FDA panel recommended it. Now it goes to the, the CDC Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice. They make a recommendation, it gets voted. Then it goes to DPH, Mass, Massachusetts, and then it comes down to us. So, you know, there's always a few more steps. I was watching it as the day went on. Oh, so that... That's what I have to offer. Okay, I only have anything else. Any questions for Jen from the board members? I have one topic not anticipated by the chair. I got an email uh, late yesterday that the interview process for 
Um, the director, the health director um, is going to be on Monday. I'm on the interview committee um, and it will start at three o'clock. It was supposed to be at two and that's all the details I have right now. I don't know if board members have any specific questions you would like me to ask during the interview process. Um, if you do, please email them to me. Um, and I'll be home in an Amherst after this weekend for the unforeseeable future. Mm. Any other comments? Okay. Well, thank you all for all your work. Um, Lauren, welcome. Please do go get your um, work signed. Um, call the town, uh, town hall. The town is it at the town clerk for swearing oh, in. Um, and I don't have anything else. Anybody else have anything else? Can I have a motion to adjourn at 7.03? Woo! Uh, <laughs> a motion so to adjourn? So moved. Any second? No, second. Okay. Steve. Aye. Tim. Aye. Maureen didn't Aye. miss it. <laughs> Less faces. And myself. Aye. And hopefully you'll be voting um, at our next meeting, Lauren. And thank you, Jen, for all your work. Yep, my pleasure. Okay. All right. Take care, you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.